let's talk about Holy Communion. For some folks, the Lord's Supper is the high point of the worship service. Others decide to pass on communion and exit the service early. Is Holy Communion an intimate moment with the King of the Universe? Or is it merely a symbol that triggers the memory of Christ's passion? You're listening to Craving Answers, Craving God. And today, we'll take up the subject of the Sacrament of Holy Communion. I'm Chuck Rathard with Aaron Miller. Aaron is the pastor at St. James Lutheran Church in Glen Carbon, Illinois. And a side note, here's a friendly reminder that you can access this episode as well as all of our other episodes from our website, cacg.stjamesglencarbon.org. Aaron, the word communion suggests a group of people gathered together in unity. But across the spectrum of Christian churches and denominations, there seems to be anything but unity when it comes to understanding and teaching on the Lord's Supper. What is going on? Well, people have um, different ways that they read the Bible. It's it's a good question because um, a lot of people say, well, the Bible clearly says that X. How come your side? How come your side doesn't agree with X? But we're all reading the same. But Christians are, and I mean, this is a um, you know one question we should talk about is uh, if we have time is how how do we talk about communion to outsiders to non Christians who uh, it's extremely confusing. Uh, you know, when you guys get together and talk about cannibalizing the person you worship, that's kind of a weird thing. But for Christians. Uh, there's a whole lot, like you say, Chuck. There's a whole lot of different views on what what is the Lord's Supper and what's going on there. And it seems like it should just be easy to open the Bible up and read it, and everybody agrees that what it says is true. But I'll try to do this real fast. Um, all these different denominations. This is one of the things that makes different denominations different is that they have a different worldview. They have a different way of viewing reality that's incredibly striking, although we don't notice it. And one of the main issues, I'll try to make this as plain as possible. One of the main issues is that for the past three to 400 years, um, since the Enlightenment, there's been a move to separate physical reality and, and non-physical reality, whatever you want to call that, the spiritual or the psychological or the, the mental, to separate those two things into separate parts. Many Christians Why have, is that? Well, uh, what's the point of that? Well, uh, it's it's a uh, a lot of it goes back to uh, to Plato and his view of the world, which is that um, the physical is necessary, but it's dirty and broken and temporary. And behind all of the physical, there's this pure spiritual world out there, and we've all kind of latched onto that. I mean, it's it's hard to avoid thinking in terms of spiritual and physical in ways that the Bible doesn't. It kind of got picked up in the Enlightenment as a way to emphasize the life of the mind, uh, reason and rationalism. Uh, Christians responded to this move by uh, embracing this as well, by saying that the physical is not important and the spiritual or the mental is important. This comes across in a lot of ways. It comes across in a certain sort of escapist piety. You know, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Like is this physical? Uh, there's there's a hymn that's in the hymn book at my church, which we sing sometimes in funerals, and I always try to encourage people not to sing it. Called, um, oh no, I'm going to forget what it's called. I'm but a str- I'm just a stranger here, and uh, with this notion of like I, I was never supposed to live on earth anyway. My real home is heaven. Is my home? Yes, it's way up there in the sky somewhere, and. Uh, sometimes it comes across in terms of, uh, you know, rationalism, that uh, c- kind of uh, the real life is the life of the mind. What goes on in your head is more valuable than what goes on in your day-to-day with your body, you know. And, um, well, so the Christians, everybody's sort of picked up on this in our culture. Uh, picked up on it is, is the wrong way to say. We, we all just grow up with this. And it comes across in the way that we think about communion. And the the way it works is this, is that if you come from this mindset and you think, well, the physical is bad and the pure spiritual is good, 
then what the heck are we doing passing out wine and crackers in church? What does that have to do with anything? Well, one answer is, this is the Baptist answer, and some of our listeners, if you've listened to a lot of our podcast, you might know that I, I grew up Baptist. I was a Baptist pastor for a while. One, one of the things that the Baptist will say is, well, it's an object lesson. The physical things don't have any value in themselves. The bread and the wine don't have any value in themselves, but they point to deeper spiritual truths. It's a reminder that Jesus died for you. And the main thing is that you think about that. In other words, you know, faith is valuable when it's happening in your head or in your heart or inside of you somehow. Whereas I don't think that that's, I think that's more Plato. I think that's more enlightenment than it is Bible. I think that in the Bible, God consistently uses physical things to rescue his people, whether it's uh, floodwaters in the story of Exodus, whether it's a burning bush, well, ultimately, God himself becomes physical, God becomes a human being. And so when, when I come to Holy Communion now, I come with this notion that the physical and the spiritual, God uses them together. And so anyway, to, be, to answer your question, the reason why I see Holy Communion different now than I did when I was a Baptist is not because I'm somehow, I found some new verses of the Bible, that it's because I'm reading the Bible in a different way. Now I'm reading the Bible not as a spiritual manual to help me internally be more connected with God, but as a story of how God acts in the physical world to definitely do spiritual, in other words, Holy Spirit-powered things, but that he does use physical things. So to sum it up, you're saying that some Christians believe that Christ is really present in Holy Communion, while others say is not really present, but that partaking in the sacrament causes us to remember his suffering, his death, and resurrection. Yes. Yeah. So g give me your clear position, remembering that we're talking to people who probably are from one end of the spectrum to the other on this question. Well, so yeah, what I agree with the Baptist about is, is that Holy Communion does help us think about Jesus, of course, um, but it's more than that. Uh, the language all throughout the Bible, all throughout the New Testament, I should say, is, is that in Holy Communion, Jesus is present and is giving himself to us. Um, so he says, this is my body. And I, and I know that's, that, that there are some listeners out there who will be like, well, that's a metaphor. Just hold on. Let me run through this real quick. Uh, you know, Jesus says, this is my body. This is my blood. Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, thing, 1 Corinthians 10, 11, he th says things like, uh, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? It's a participation in the blood of Christ. The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? So so first of all, just taking it at its face value, what it means is, is that when we have Holy Communion, we are participating in the body and blood of Jesus. Now, my Baptist friends will uh, will allegorize that, will turn that into a metaphor it doesn't really mean that Christ is present. It means that Christ is, he's here with us, but not in the way that it says, not physically. He's actually, it's just a metaphor for Christ's presence with all of his church spiritually, or, to, you know, to, if you have faith, Jesus lives in your heart, and the, the, the you know, the, the bread and the grape juice help you think about Jesus, and if you think about Jesus and believe in him, he's there in your heart, so it's kind of an aid. Now, I would say that's, that's true as far as it goes, but it does not go far enough. And, and I'll, I'll say it this way. Uh, so first of all, you have just the plain meaning of the text. It's a participation in the body and blood of Christ. Second of all, though, I, I don't need to think about Jesus. That's not what I need. I need Jesus. I need communion with Jesus. I need Christ to be with me. Well, I need, what, what parts of me need Christ with me? Well, all the parts of me, my mind does, my emotions do, my, uh, you know, my uh, biology does, my, my neurons and my chemicals and my physical body, my bones and my muscles, every single bit of it needs to be saved by Jesus. Salvation is not primarily, in the Bible, salvation is not something that primarily happens between our ears. It is something that happens to all of us is what the resurrection from the dead is about. It's what the incarnation is about. God becomes a human being with a body and a soul so that he can rescue my body and soul. Now, what I need is not just to simply think about Jesus. I need Jesus to rescue me. 
the the quality of real presence, the doctrine of real presence, believed by a lot of people, believed by the Lutherans. Uh, Lutherans defend, uh, descended from the Reformation anyway. Um, it, Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, that's a lot of people. So if I were a member of one of those denominations or one that I didn't name, and I let you in on a little secret, yeah, I am a member of one of those denominations, but I don't really believe in real presence, and I really don't want to talk about it. What would you say to me? Well, I'd probably say I'd probably do say what I just said. Well, let's look at scripture. Um, the Bible always talks about communion as a participation in Christ, as an eating and a drinking of His body and blood. Okay, so there's just the plain meaning. I, I know there's such a thing as metaphor, but I don't think we should go to metaphor first unless we have good reasons to. Second of all, what do you need? You know, do, do you uh, do you, along with our culture, believe that the mental and the psychological and the quote spiritual unquote is valuable, but the physical is invaluable? I would just say that's not the way that you. That, that's really not what you need. You don't want your brain to fly up to heaven someday to die and be with God forever. You want God to raise your body from the dead. What you really need is God to physically rescue you, which in fact he does, which in fact he does in Holy Communion. So so what the Bible teaches about Holy Communion, that Christ is actually, all of Christ, his body and soul are physically present for us in Holy Communion, that actually matches up better with what the Bible says our need is, which is our bodies and souls are in trouble and need saved. So, you know, what do you need? That's I, I would say that you know what are you looking for? Are you looking for intellectual help? You can have that. And that goes to your worldview. Yes, it's very very basic. It's presuppositional. It goes back to what the way that you view the world and reality. So Matthew eighteen says, it quotes Jesus as saying, "For where two or three are gathered in my name, right. there am I among them." Mm -hmm. Or I might paraphrase and say, "There am I really present with them." Yes. Is that the same thing as the real presence of Christ in the body and blood of the sacrament of Holy Communion, or is it different somehow? How do you compare those two things? Well, it's d definitely, it's, there's, there's uh, similarities and differences. So to start off with similarity, well, differences. One comes to us, um, well, the, there, one comes to us via the, uh, one comes to us via the bread and wine of Holy Communion. Christ gives himself to us via the bread and wine of Holy Communion. The other one, Christ gives himself to us in Christian community. Now, these two things are bound together, which if Paul connects them to each other in 1 Corinthians 11 and 12. These two things are in, indissoluble. What's that word there? Indissoluble. Thank you very much. They are very, they're connected and you, you can't split them there. up. No, it was good. I was glad you bailed <laughs> me out. I thought it was going to be a five-minute conversation trying to figure out what I was trying to say. Uh, those two things go together. Now, they are slightly different. C communion... Uh, we use the word for we use the word communion for both of them, like you mentioned at the beginning. Um, communion can be bread and wine of Holy Communion, Lord's Supper. Communion can also be the relationship that Christians have with each other by the power of the Holy Spirit by being baptized into the same Jesus Christ. Now that that's the similarity. The difference is is that Holy Communion is one thing, and uh, communion, which is connected to it, communion with our brothers and sisters in Christ, can happen outside of Holy Communion, but. In both cases, Christ is giving Himself to us. He's in our He's in our midst, where the where two or three are gathered. He's there. So you have many relationships. You have relationships with people here at St. James. You also have a wife. You have a relationship with your wife. They're all relationships, but they're not the same. So this is what I'm thinking, and I'm willing to be corrected. When when I think that two or three are gathered together, there I am in the midst. Somehow that's easier for me to accept the reality of Christ's presence mm, yeah. there among us. But the eating the body and drinking the blood seems to me to be, I'm, I'm going to use this word, more intimate, more closer, not more yeah. closer, close. Yeah. Um, am I just supposing too much here? Well, the, the Holy Communion, the, ta the, the eating and drinking of Christ's body and blood ramps it up a notch um, I mean, if you want, like, I mean, simply because you get the communion with each other with that, plus you get the bread and wine of Holy Communion. So it's a doubling of that. Um, if, if two or three of, you know, if I'm with two or three of my Christian brothers and sisters, we, Christ is there in the midst of us. 
When I come to the rail, I have that. I have the two or three of them there, plus I get the bread and wine of Holy Communion. So yeah, for sure, it's a doubling up of that. It's a it's it's an intensification of that. What I don't want to do though is to say the one is spiritual and the other is physical. That's dividing things up. By, by spiritual, we, we biblically we mean infused with the power of the Holy Spirit, given to us by the power of the Holy Spirit, and He's involved in both Holy Communion, the meal, and Holy Communion, the relationship between the brothers and sisters of Christ. So if it's easy for us to get the, where two or three of you are gathered in the midst of, if, if, if we're like, oh, I can get that, a lot of times what we mean is I get it because I can spiritualize it. Yeah. Like Jesus, like he's here somehow present ethereally. And what I want to say is that that's not the case. He's there physically as well because we're told that he, that the church is his body by Paul several times. And what Paul means is the body of Christ is the body of Christ Christ is physically present where his church is at. So you just had a birthday. I won't tell everybody how old you are, but you've got a few laps around the track. Um, how many times have you said the Lord's Prayer in your life, do you think, inside of worship uh, services or in your personal prayer life? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't. It'd be, I'd Hundreds, have to do a thousands, lot of math. Yeah. Lots of times. Yeah. And there's a danger that the next time you say it, you might the words might come out of your mouth, and you might not even know what you're saying. Because it's something you've done so many times in your life, yeah. let alone what you mean by what you're saying when you say the Lord's Prayer. What about Holy Communion? For those who are listening to us who've been to, to Holy Communion over the course of their lives hundreds, maybe even thousands of times, is there a chance that you could take what you've described as a really important moment yeah. and just sort of yeah. play it down? Sure. I mean, yeah. Yeah, sure. It, 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 things can get old if you do them thoughtlessly. You know, you can get monotonous. You can get where, where you're not. I don't know about, about you, but when I do things a lot of times, it seems inevitable that it will be thoughtlessly at some point. Sure. I. Uh, this is actually one of the arguments against having weekly communion. I. You know, my church celebrates communion every Sunday. I know. I was talking to a Baptist friend recently, uh, and she told me that um, the church that she's a member of celebrates communion once a quarter on a Wednesday night during the quarter, never on Sundays. It's not all that long ago that uh, Lutherans communed once a quarter. Yeah, yeah. And, and then Lutherans in our area here. Yeah. And uh, that one of the reasons was is you just you, you you wanted to stay fresh. I was at a church prior to the church I'm at now and um actually just before as I was coming to that right before I came to that church uh, they had transitioned from having communion every other Sunday to every Sunday. And there was a, a significant number of people who said, we need to keep it every other Sunday because it'll just get old. But um, yeah, that's yeah, you, you don't want it to get old. You know, uh, Be mindful, be thoughtful. But, but honestly, you know, I, I wouldn't say, you know, I kiss my wife a lot, but you know, maybe I should stop kissing her so it's more special whenever I do kiss her. <laughs> That's kind of a ridiculous thing to say because it's a relationship, right? I mean, and um, do, do I want to be mindful when I'm hanging out with my friends? Of course I do. I want to listen to their stories. But if, if I find myself mentally drifting, I don't think the solution is to cut them off for a, a few weeks. The solution is to like, hey, it's, it's pretty special having friends. It's pretty special having a spouse. Like lock yourself in here, Aaron. Don't take this for granted. It, but But... But honestly, at the end of the day, too, uh, if I have a conversation with my wife thoughtlessly, it's still a conversation with my wife. The burden is not on me to, like, this conversation only has value if I, like, pay attention to every word she says. Just being with her is the thing. And sometimes our conversations are boring and sometimes they're interesting, but being with her is the thing. And Holy Communion is the same way. Holy Communion doesn't have value because... It's stirring up deep thoughts in ourselves. That's kind of drifting into the Baptist view of communion. Holy communion has value because Jesus loves us and wants to be with us, and he gets to be with us. And so I, I always tell people, you know, I've, I've had conversations with people a lot about, you know, like, um, you know, how should I prepare myself for uh, coming to, like, what kind of thoughts should I have up there? And my response is always, you know, hey, repent of your sin, ask Christ to forgive you, and then just go do it. The main point is just the doing of it, not like what's going on in your head. Christ gives himself to us, and just so just do it. 
You referenced 1 Corinthians two or three times here in our conversation. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 29 says, For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good one. This seems good. You, I'm glad you're happy with that. This seems to me to be something of an ominous statement. Oh, yeah. How yeah. exactly does, and I'm serious about the word exactly, how exactly does one discern the body? Yeah, well, so I said good. I know it's ominous. I said good because it's just brilliant. Paul is brilliant. So in 1 Corinthians 11, and I well, actually I just mentioned this earlier, Paul using the word body. So in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul talks about Holy Communion. He gives the words of institution. A lot of me and my – I do this too, me and my Lutheran friends. We like 1 Corinthians 11. Okay, what's it about? It's about Holy Communion. Let's dig in here and figure out what's going on with the Lord's Supper, which is t- totally appropriate. But actually, that text is not primarily about the Lord's Supper. Paul brings in the Lord's Supper as an example to illustrate a larger point which is people in the church at Corinth have divided up socioeconomically. The rich have not been sharing with the poor in their weekly fellowship meals. And Paul, what he wants them to see is that you can't do that. You can't divide the church between the haves and the have-nots because in Jesus Christ, you have all become one body. It's what he says at the beginning of chapter 11. That's his argument. He brings in Holy Communion as a way to say, look, you, you, you come to the rail, and whatever, your, whatever your, uh, you know, your income level is, whatever your gender is, whatever your race is, you are all receiving Jesus, the one body and blood of Jesus Christ we all receive. And, and that transitions him into chapter 12 where he says, we are the body of Christ. And um, so all of us together, uh, we have d- different functions, he says. We have different giftings that God has given us. But all, it, it, the Holy Spirit, the one spirit has joined us into the one body of Christ in order to be a functioning, working representation. Manifest, the re- representation is the wrong word. Manifestation of Christ's presence. We are the body of Christ. So when he says in that verse that you read, 1 Corinthians 11, uh, 20 something, I can't remember the verse, but um, he says, uh, you, are, you have to discern the body of Christ. The question, what does he mean? He means a couple different things. One of the things he means is you have to discern the body, the community of Jesus. You're the body of Christ, the church is. You have to discern that. You cannot, if you come to church and you're like, well, the rich people are, you know, closer to God than the poor people, or you know, my type is closer than the, their type, whatever those types are. Then you are not discerning the body of Christ. Also, though, when you come to the rail, you must discern the body of Christ. He is actually giving Himself to us in Holy Communion in such a way that we are bound to each other. I ingest the one Christ. The person kneeling next to me at the rail also is taking in the same Christ. That binds us together. We both receive the same body. That makes us the same body. So the body of Christ, Holy Communion, is the body of Christ. And that's why you asked a question earlier about the two or three of us are the gathered. And I wanted to join those together organically because Paul does. Our community as a, as a, as a body of believers in the Christian church is sealed, signed, and delivered by the body and blood of Christ, which he gives us in Holy Communion. And you can't separate those things. So to discern those things means both of those. Discern that when you're receiving the bread and wine, you are receiving all of Christ for you. But also to discern that what that makes me and my brothers and sisters in the rail is the body of blood of Christ. That's my identity now is this group of people who have been baptized into Jesus. So it seems to me that the word discern or discernment can mean the outcome of some kind of intellectual exercise. You can accumulate a certain amount of data or evidence, and you can discern something from it and and draw a conclusion. It seems to me also that this can be done in the spiritual realm based on faith. So that, stop me if I go in the ditch here so we don't waste time. So that if you approach this point that Paul makes in 1 Corinthians 11, with intellect only, you will not be able to discern what Paul is trying to point out here. Is that true? Well, uh, 
Yes, if what you mean is if you try to rationalize it. That's what I mean. Yes. Yeah, no. It's no, a, no faith, just read the words and discern. Yes, it's a relationship, It's a, which always comes back to faith. I mean, the intellectual is important, too, for, for, for those who can. But it can only go so far. It can only go so far. But, but it's super important. We talked about this earlier. Uh, um, it comes after faith, but it's definitely important. The intellectual comprehension of it is a response to the faith in it. This is the this is the It seems to me that the faith, the discernment that comes to the person of faith because they have faith. Right, yes. informs the intellect. Definitely. This is the old St. Augustine thing we talked about uh several episodes ago, could be 20 episodes ago. I don't know, I lose track of time. Uh you know, uh a faith seeking understanding. The understanding will never get you to faith. But once granted faith by the Holy Spirit, the understanding will come. So it can be grasped rationally, but only to the person who, by faith, has joined up in this relationship to understand this is bread and wine. Yes, definitely. But it's also Christ for me. This person sitting next to me who I don't even know, maybe, or who I got in a fight with two weeks ago is I don't have a single thing in common with this person, but Christ for them, Christ for me, that makes us the same body. This is, I, I have more, like, I am the knee to this person's ankle. We are in dis, uh, that one word you said earlier, we, we are um, um, permanently joined to each other. That can, You're right, that can only happen uh, by faith, which is uh, a relational thing. God gives himself to us in a relationship, and we're like, oh, that's it. And then that should lead us, like Augustine says, to intellectual understanding. So let's talk about the ominous word in this verse. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. I think my first instinct is to try to de-emphasize that word judgment, to play it down. It can't be as bad as it sounds. That's probably a mistake to try to do that. So how serious, how severe is this judgment? Well, Paul says uh, there, he says, some of you have um, died or some of you have slept because of this. I, I think it, I, I honestly, it, it, it depends. I, um, it depends. I, I took communion for a long time, not discerning the body and blood of Christ in Holy Communion. And God's been immensely good to me. I, I think that, uh, you know, one of the things that's going on there with the word judgment is not that God is going around blowing people up who get this wrong. Uh, the judgment there is like a discipline type judgment to guide us and direct us closer to him. Uh, like you discipline your kids when you want them to uh, learn how to be better humans. It's it's more of that. It's not like a hatred or a blowing up. It's um, a guidance into uh, closer and closer to the truth. If somebody comes to the rail and they take Holy Communion and then they insist upon thinking that somehow they're better than people of other races – or people of other economic categories, they are not discerning the body of Christ. And God's going to take care of that. If they belong to him, he is going to weed that garden. He is going to purify that person. He's going to sanctify them, whatever it takes. If somebody comes to Holy Communion and they're like, this is just, this isn't the body and blood of Christ. This is just bread and, this is just bread and grape juice. Uh, again, God is going to deal with them. He's going to guide them into truth. He's going to, uh, and I've noticed this a lot with my, uh, with uh, when I've talked to my Baptist friends or my Reform friends, especially my Reform friends who have, who are a bit more thoughtful about Holy Communion, is that their stated beliefs over time have become less and less real to them, and the experience of Holy Communion of meeting with Jesus at Holy Communion that becomes more and more of their reality, and they start to talk about. Uh, uh, receiving the body and blood of Christ instead of like, you know, uh, taking this uh, object lesson that helps me think about it. They start becoming more and more like that. Well, that's a lot of that times that's happening because God is, uh, you know, quote, judging, uh, unquote them, disciplining them, shaping and molding them to the experiences of their life to realize like, you know what, if this is just, if this is just cracker and grape juice, just, there's no need to do this. Just stay at home. You, know, you can think about Jesus without those things, right? And, and then realizing, you know, actually where I'm at in my life, I need more than that and craving more than that. Maybe I'm thinking about myself. Maybe I'm thinking about the current state of my life, and I'm thinking I, sh I am and I should be under God's judgment. I have got to get my act together. What would you say to someone who says, I look forward to attending communion, but I've got some things in my life that I need to clean up first? 
Well, that, that's a good, that's a good, that, 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 that's actually, you're leading me to probably say it in a better way than I just said it a second ago, talking about, you know, judgment and discipline. Uh, you know, Holy Communion is not for perfect people. It's for sinful people. You know, and, and Luther famously talked about this sort of medieval impulse to keep yourself away from communion until you get your life cleaned up. This, sort of this notion of like, well, I can't meet with Jesus until I kind of repent and, and get right with God. And um, not, not you know, get repenting and getting right with God, definitely valuable things, but you can't do that in order to receive communion. You need communion in order to do that. And so when you come to communion as, um, it, when you come to communion as like, God, I need you, I need your son Jesus here to help me repent, that's the right way to do it. If you come thinking like, I need to repent so that I can earn communion, that's actually deeply unbiblical. Uh, Christ died for sinners. He died for sinners. He gives himself to sinners. Nobody needs communion more than the incredibly sinful person. And I was just talking to a group of uh, seniors at our local Lutheran high school uh, recently about, you know, who, who, who do we keep away from communion at my church? And the answer is not a single person in the world who says, I'm a sinner and I repent and I believe that this is Christ for me here in Holy Communion. I would never say like, well, you commit this. What, what sin do you struggle with? Like, oh, I have a list of four or five sins that if you struggle with this, you can't. If somebody came to me and said, uh, I'm cheating on my wife, um, can I take communion? I would say, well, are you going to repent? Are you repenting? Are you repentant? If so, yes, absolutely. This is uh, the Holy Communion was made for adulterers who are repenting. Um, uh, somebody comes to me and says, I've murdered somebody. Do I withhold communion from them? Absolutely not, if they're repentant. And we can talk about what it means to repent of murder. Different at, program. Yeah, different program. But I would never be like, well, you know, you need, you probably need to do your time first, go to prison, then we'll give you communion. I would say, no, if you're repentant, you, uh, my murderous friend, need, re need communion more than anybody. Christ is dying to give himself to you, quite literally. And uh, come here and receive this. This is for you. Um, so if you're feeling like, if any of our listeners are ever feeling like, I don't know if I'm worthy of this, that, my friend, makes you worthy. What would you say to a person who believes that by going to the Lord's Supper, he is satisfying the command, quote, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, and by going to communion, thereby earns some portion of God's favor by his obedience? Oh, I just say, well, yeah, you're supposed to go to communion, but you're kind of missing the point. The point is, a it's a relationship. The point isn't fulfilling a command. You know, uh, um, Paul says in Ephesians that husbands are supposed to love their wives, but I don't hardly ever kiss my wife and think, okay, I fulfilled that command, and, and now I've earned her favor and God's favor. I kiss my wife because it's fun to kiss my wife. And it's, it's that relationship where it's happening. Now, if I'm not kissing my wife, then somebody needs to tell me, hey, you need to love your wife better. But I, I don't kiss my wife in order to fulfill a command. I, can, I kiss her because that's the kind of relationship we have. I hang out with my friends not because like, well, okay, check that off. Hopefully they like me. I hang out with my friends because it's fun to hang out with my friends. And I come to Holy Communion for basically the same reasons. You come to Holy Communion uh, not because there's some, you know, not because you're not checking into work. You know, God doesn't have like a, a clipboard where he marks you off when you come. He wants a relationship with us. And when we come and we hang out with him at Holy Communion and he gives himself completely, all of himself to us, that's the, the, that's the relationship that's happening. That's you, where it's at. You just said he wants a relationship with us. So I'm guessing, I don't have any data to support this, but I'm guessing that most of us, when we think about the Holy Communion possibility moment, we think about it beginning with ourselves. God is in the distance, or maybe God yeah. is way up high, and so I come to Holy Communion, I sort of present myself to God, and then when I'm done taking Holy Communion, I go back and sit down. Let's look at it here in our last question. Yeah. He desires a relationship with us. Right. So Jesus Christ suffered, died, and rose again so that he could have what he wanted a relationship with those expelled people from Genesis chapter three. Yeah. Could you address that? Look, you know, help me see it from his perspective. Yeah. There's a place in the Old Testament somewhere where after they got out in the wilderness, after the Exodus, they got organized with three tribes on the north and three tribes on the south. This wasn't just 
being with his people, it was organized. Yes. It was intentional. Yeah. Can you put all that in our final answer here? Yeah, I think that's a great place to end. And that, and that comes back, question to Chuck, to your question about um, um, your question about you know coming as you know doing something to gain God's favor. Um, and this is this may be this might be the most helpful thing that you and I can say to our Baptist and Reformed friends who are listening is um, uh, our, our, there's a, a word in uh, German Lutheranism called uh, Gottesdienst, which just means God's service. And, and what's behind that word is that the worship service is not us serving God, not us coming to do things for him, you know, to give him money, to sing some songs, to listen to a sermon, to obey that command about, you know, as often as you eat and drink. You know, so I remember he, he when will... I first heard this and I was literally stunned to learn what you're describing right yeah. now. Yeah, it's not, worship is, you know, we do not come to the worship service to serve God. We come to the worship service because it is God serving us. The That's worship pretty radical serv- stuff for some folks. It will change the way people think about preaching, about Holy Communion, about baptism, about uh, singing hymns, about commu- uh, fellowship and community in the church, is that God gives himself to us. He is always the initiator, always the initiator. He always comes to us. He always makes the first move. And at Holy Communion, we aren't, the whole church service actually, is God rending the heavens open and breaking down the barrier between eternity and time, between infinity and and of uh, finite space and time and coming down here with us and giving himself to us. And when you come to Holy Communion, you should always come with the sure and certain knowledge that he has invited you there because he wants you to be there. He has drawn you there. He is not saying, come and do this so that you can get to me. He's saying, I'm already here. I'm giving myself to you. Just come and enjoy it. And that should always be our first move is to come there as, as hungry recipients of Jesus himself. And that is a beautiful thing. Very much so, yeah. Learning, reversing that all the burden is on me and God is passively watching how well I do it to him actively serving the people that he has brought to himself. And it changes the the question to like the question of like, how do I do communion right? That's like, that's the wrong question. He's already giving himself to you. You can't mess up here. All right. Thanks for listening to Craving Answers, Craving God, here with Aaron Miller. He is pastor at St. James Lutheran Church in Glen Carbon, Illinois. If you'd like to express your opinion on this show, you'll find a comment option at the bottom of our episode page. If you enjoyed this edition of Craving Answers, Craving God, please tell your friends about us. And on our episode page, you'll find a place where you can leave a comment. I'm Chuck Rather. 